And tonight's speaker has been with Archaeology Southwest. Uh, she's a uh, recent PhD from the School of Anthropology at uh, University of Arizona. She started with working with us, I believe, in 2009. Might have even been earlier, eight? 2008. So, um, Catherine Dungan, um, very sharp young uh, woman who is just in the process of, of starting a postdoc here at uh, Arizona State University. So uh, she's transitioning from Tucson up to uh, the Tempe, Phoenix area. So uh, tonight's talk is a focus on uh, using creative new technologies to think about uh, the past and, and model the past in, in creative ways. So with uh, no further ado, I will turn it over to to Catherine, her creative title. Um, Look on my work, see mighty, modeling Chaco and Great House visibility. Catherine, thank you. Okay, I think I've, all right, I, I have successfully turned on the microphone. That's step, step one this evening. <laughs> uh, thank you all very, very much for coming out tonight. This is a really great crowd. Um, and as Bill said, I, I will soon be a Phoenician, or at least whatever you call somebody who lives in Tempe. Um, Tempeites, perhaps. Uh, so I'm concerned to make a good impression. What I, I'm, so tonight I'm going to talk about a specific project looking at uh, visibility between sites in two great house communities southwest of Chaco Canyon. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the results of that and why I think they're, they're interesting and important. Uh, but I also want to phrase that, I also want to contextualize that within a larger discussion of um, visibility as an archaeological problem. Um, why archaeologists are interested in that and how can we address it. I'm going to keep the methodological discussion uh, to a minimum. I've slowly learned that for some reason talking about the architecture of database and the input into programs makes people's eyes glaze over. Um, we can bring that up in the discussion if you like. I would like nothing better. But, um, and then also there will be a brief poetry reading. Uh, <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Um, I, have, having been told this is our, our, our swan song at this Micaiah's, I thought it was appropriate. And it will also explain the title. Um, so I should begin by, uh, I think, explaining what I mean in this context when I talk about visibility. Archaeologists um, use this term in a lot of contexts in a lot of ways. For example, if you're out on survey and you're talking about how well you can see the artifacts on the ground. Tonight, what I mean when I'm talking about visibility is at the scale of people and buildings and landscapes. So from where can I see this building? Can, I, can people at these two sites see one another? Can I see, what, if I'm across the valley, can I see what's going on at this great house? So visibility at these much larger scales of, of the built environment, as opposed to visibility, say, of, of artifacts or safety vests. Um, Archaeologists have been interested uh, in visibility for a very long time um, as, as a component of how we're interested in, in where things are on the landscape, why sites are where they are, how people are using the landscape. And so, of course, there are a lot of ways to approach this problem, um, many of which, the most basic of which, of course, go, involve going out on the landscape and seeing what you can see. Um, Obviously, that's a uh, basic first step. Archaeologists in general like to be outside. What I'm going to do tonight is to talk about an approach that utilizes computer modeling, um, what we would call visibility or view shed analysis using software developed for geographic information science. Uh, there are a number of advantages to using this kind of modeling software over just going out there and seeing what you can see in that you can handle much larger data sets. So you can look at much larger numbers of sites, things that you would need an army of volunteers to go check out. Um, you can model the landscape as it was in the past. So before sites crumbled, for example, you can control conditions much better than you can. Well, you, you really can't control, control conditions in the field. So if there's, if there's a windstorm, you're just in trouble. 
Um, and then finally, you can also compensate a little bit uh, for the limited knowledge that you have when you go out on the landscape. So um, it's really important to, to deal with the way human beings experience the landscape and to get out there and, and look. But at the same time, my two days wandering around Kimbaniola don't equal somebody's lifetime experience of the same landscape. Um, you know, you don't learn the landscape in the same way in that short amount of time. So there are a lot of interesting things that we can get out of building models to do this. But to step back a little bit, why should we do this anyway? Why do archaeologists care about visibility? Or really, actually, why do people care about visibility, right? Because what archaeologists are really trying to get to is what it's like to be alive in the past. Um, so I want to ask you guys for a few ideas about why do people care about visibility when they're, when they're building sites, building homes, pu putting things in places on the landscape, or visiting places on the landscape? What are some reasons that people might care about visibility? OK, so that's, that's a big one. Wow. Oh, God. OK, let me repin this. All right. We're just going to be really careful with this. <laughs> my, my Vanna White pose. Would, any, would anyone else like to buy a vowel? <laughs> uh, so in addition to communication, what else? Security. OK, security. Uh, security, pardon my handwriting. We'll also put defense. All right, trade. So if people can see you, they know where to come. All right. Yes. So I can't spell aesthetics offhand, so we're going to put nice view. Thank you for phrasing it that way, Matt. Um, so, yes, as somebody who's been looking at apartments for the past couple of days, yeah, just, you know, aesthetic reasons. Any other thoughts? OK, so yeah, let's, hmm. All right, let's we're gonna squeeze it in here. And I'm going to abbreviate that as power. I'm definitely going to come back to this. Any more? Sure. I don't know whether communication involves people OK, yes. So communication and also hmm, how to lump this in. Um, yeah, we'll say. Ritual, religion, and also sort of down here with nice view, significance of the landscape, let's say. So for any number of reasons, you might want to be able to see um, the mountains or the buttes or the landscape features that really help frame and define your world. So. It's a, a nice set to be going on with. Um, and what I'm particularly interested in tonight uh, crosses a number of these. Um, particularly, we're talking about religion, communication, and indeed power. And actually, um, as I'm sure many of you know, all or most of these have been talked about in regards to Chaco and Great Houses in Chaco Canyon. Um, communication, particularly in signaling, views of the landscape, um, absolutely ritual and religion and power. Um, these places as pilgrimage centers, as gathering places. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much we talk about just having a nice view at Chaco, but, um, and people have even talked about, have also talked about these views as defensive, or it's a little less common here. Um, I did warn you there was gonna be a poetry reading. So, the, as some of you may or may not have recognized, the title of the talk is borrowed from a poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, the poem is called Ozymandias. Uh, and he wrote this in the early, uh, the early 19th century, inspired by a description of a collapsed statue of an Egyptian pharaoh. Um, and he describes his imagined view of this, this statue, there's nothing standing left but the legs, there's a head lying in, in the sand, this dilapidated statue of a king. And on the pedestal 
of the statue, the inscription reads, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So the reason, I, I did warn you, the reason I brought up Ozymandias um, tonight is not because I want to make a point about tyranny or power and hubris, um, which is probably what Shelley was aiming at, um, and which some people would go that direction with Chaco. What I want to bring up is the idea that monumental architecture, when people build big things, they are in some sense wanting to send a message. They're trying to communicate something. So who is the audience for this? Um, under what circumstances are these messages meant to be viewed and interpreted? That's why I've dragged Percy, Percy Bysshe Shelley in tonight. Um, so, of course, um, this is not, if, I, if we were to try and give you an overview of Chaco and archeology, span we would take up far more time than we actually have this evening. Um, so, I apologize if I'm gonna move a little bit fast on Chaco. We do have the fact sheets and the magazines in the back. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, it's really architecture that defines Chaco as a regional phenomenon. Um, you have great houses, these scaled up residential, uh, or in many ways residential places. You have great kivas, which have their own complex history but become involved in Chaco and archeology. span um, Both of these are built um, in the Chaco core, and then in particular, Great Houses um, and Great Kivas both spread around the upper San Juan Basin and really make up what we think of as the Chaco world. These are, these are the nuts and bolts of what make Chaco something huge. Um, and of course, you see the Great Houses beginning in the 800s and 900s, and then they're built through the 1000s and into the 1100s. Great houses and great kivas both are monumental. And I mean that in the sense um, both that they're compared to other things in the society they exist in, they're very large. They're oversized, they're overbuilt. But I also, but when I call them monumental, I also mean that more and more there's a consensus that these are significant places, that they have some kind of ritual religious meaning, that they're, that they're meant to carry messages, that they are in some way related to this larger Chacoan ideology. So the monumental in multiple senses. And then I should add, of course, that um, there is Chacoan architecture that's smaller and may still be um, very significant, and particularly of interest with visibility. I'm thinking here um, of roads, but particularly of what we often call shrines. Which are um, which can be quite small, um, both you know, say six seven meters across, knee high walls. So they're not really impressive architectural features, but they're very intimately related to visibility, and they're very often on very high places with excellent views of the landscape. So this evening, the story that I want to tell you focuses on two great houses southwest of Chaco Canyon. Um, and this is the, the first map in your handout. We'll show you where these two places are. Um, Kinbaniola and Kinclijin are essentially in Chaco Canyon's backyard. Uh, they're actually part of the park. I'm not sure what their current visitation status is. Um, and I should say that this uh, the project started um, a very long time ago with my master's thesis at thesis work at Kimbaniola, and we recently expanded it uh, working with Archaeology Southwest, Southwest and the University of Arizona project that my colleague Leslie Aragon and I have done. She's in the back. Um, so when I call, uh, so when I call these great house communities, um, I'm referring to clusters of small sites around great houses. And we can, talk, uh, we can talk in the discussion about the philosophy of, of community. And there's a lot, a lot of interesting stuff to be said there. But 
basically, these are places where there are a lot of small sites. People who live there would have been interacting with one another. And in a nuts and bolts archaeology kind of way, they cluster on the landscape around great houses. Now, despite the fact that Kimbiniola and Kinclijin are neighbors, they're on neighboring drainages, they're both, as I say, in Chaco Canyon's backyard, they, the two great houses and the two communities have very different histories. Um, first of all, the settlement history is different between the two areas. If you look at, uh, in, in both areas, both reach their peak population in the 1000s. Um, so as far as that goes, they're, they're alike. But at Kimbaniola, there's also a population much earlier. There are a decent number of people there in the 800s, and maybe into the 900s. Whereas at Kin Klajin, there really is a population explosion in the 1000s. There weren't that many people living there before. Secondly, the great houses are very different. Um, and this ties in well with the history of settlement. Kimbaniola was probably built first in the 900s. There's an old core to the great house. And it's later expanded, um, at least some of that expansion was carried out in the 1100s, into an enormous E-shaped structure. Um, the second uh, the second image in your handout has, gives the, uh, the footprints of the great houses and some other structures. The final form of Kimbiniola has 200 rooms. It's as large or larger um, than many great houses in Chaco Canyon itself. It's huge. It's massive. It's a very impressive structure. King Klajin has both a different history and a different shape. It's much smaller. It's downright petite. It has about 20 rooms. Uh, but it does have a tower kiva, so small, but upwards of 30 feet high. Um, they really built this sucker up. And it was probably entirely built in the 1000s. So it's a much younger great house. Um, it was probably built uh, all at once, possibly in the 1080s. All right, so you have different settlement histories, you have different histories of the great houses, and finally, um, you have some differences in what else is in these communities, too. In the Kimbiniol community, in addition to the Great House itself, you have an isolated Great Kiva that may also be quite early. It may have been in use in the 800s, in use in the 900s as well. Um, you have what I, what's, what's called on, on the maps a Chacoan structure. Um, you might think of it as an okay house. It's a, it's a large bump. It's great-ish. It doesn't really qualify as a great house, but... It's suspiciously large. It has rather nice masonry. And this is located on a mesa in the southern part of the area around Kimbaniola. And finally, at Kimbaniola, there are upwards of six of those shrines. Remember, I was talking about these small enclosed areas that are often on very high, very visible spaces. Kinklajin is much more alone in its area. There are three shrines or shrine-like features, and that's it, other than the Great House um, and the small sites. So some differences in a lot of categories between these two communities. In the history of small settlements, in the history of great houses themselves, and in what else you have in, um, in the area. So what can visibility tell us about this? Well, what we wanted to do, again, was look at um, under what context people were viewing the great houses? Who was the intended audience for great houses or other monumental architecture? Uh, so what we decided to do was to look at intervisibility intervis between sites. So from these small residential sites, can you see the great house or not? Um, as I said, I'm going to keep the methodological discussion very minimal tonight. Uh, the basic visibility, and I'm risking the, the paper again, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, the basic visibility tool in ArcGIS is something called a viewshed. This is uh, a, basically a play on watershed. So like a watershed is the area that drains into a spot. The viewshed is the area that a point on the landscape can see. So essentially, if I have, actually I have topography here. This is very nice. Um, <laughs> So say I have a model of a landscape, and I have a site. I ask the program, what part of this area is visible from this site? And it gives me the area. We're going to stop here, because there's a hill. Um, from that, I can compare the location of other sites and see what falls in and outside of that area. 
And eventually, if I do that for all of the sites in my data set, I can basically develop a network of visibility among sites. So say these are visible, and say these are visible, and possibly these are visible, but these are not. So a really fairly simple um, methodology of getting to this line of sight visibility between, the places, between places on the landscape. There are a number of considerations that you need to take at, into account when you run this kind of model. Um, for example, how high your viewer is, whether you're accounting for the height of the buildings or not. Distance is a key one. How far can people actually see? And this, of course, depends on what you're looking at. Um, in this case, we're dealing with fairly small areas. The longest distance between any two sites that we've considered here is less than five kilometers. So I didn't throw out any connections based on distance here, but it's definitely something that has to be considered in this kind of work. So what ultimately um, are the results that we got out of this? Oh, and I should, and of course, one more thing. Um, I'm going to compact time when I talk about this uh, for the sake of time, because we only have so much time this evening. But of course, these communities changed over time, so we looked at this over 50-year intervals. And we can do that because we have ceramic assemblages from all of these sites. And so we can get decent date ranges and add and subtract sites as they come in. So what do we learn doing this? Well, it transpires that despite what you might think, Kimbaniola, this is giant E-shaped, really monumental Kimbaniola, is actually visible to very, very few habitation sites in its community. Small site, there are only five sites, a, ma a maximum of five sites that can ever see Kimbaniola, and two, probably three of them are shrines. Um, this is out of, you know, more. 20 plus habitation sites in the area. So Kimbaniola has really low visibility. Um, in general, the habitation sites are more, visi are, are more visible. Um, it's you know, down there at the absolute bottom of visibility. Kin Klijin is enormously visible. About 80% of the small habitation sites can see the Great House. And you can actually, via the network, the spidery maps on the second two pages of the handout show this as um, using a line of sight graphic. So you have this fascinating division um, and distinction between the two great houses, which may not track with what you would think, right? I mean, Biniola is really impressive, and, and Kin Klijin is, well, not. Um, and of course, there are some other interesting results looking at the other structures in the Kimbaniola area, too. So as I said, for example, there's that isolated Great Kiva. Um, it's also not very visible. Um, however, it is, unlike Kimbaniola, it's quite close to some surrounding habitation sites. And that's pretty unique in these two areas. So while there aren't a lot of sites that can see the Great Kiva, the sites that, are, the sites that could see the Great Kiva could probably hear what was going on there and were probably intimately involved. That okay house, that bump, that great-ish thing is hugely visible. Um, it's very, very, like, um, it is almost the most visible structure in the entire area. And several of the shrines in the Kimbaniola area are also very, very highly visible. Um, Upwards of 65 or more percent of the habitation sites can be covered by a single shrine. And interestingly, almost all of the small sites in the Kimbaniola area can see at least one shrine at a distance of under one kilometer. Um, and that, that one kilometer measurement is a little bit arbitrary, but it's not a bad rule of thumb for being able to say that you would be able to see that somebody was up in that shrine. Um, Remember, these are only about knee height. Um, so if somebody's standing in them, you could tell that somebody was up there. So the shrines at Kimbaniola cover the area pretty well. Interestingly, the shrines at King Klijin, eh, they aren't that visible. And actually, one of them isn't visible to anything else in the community at all. Um, and there's at least one very low visibility shrine around Kimbaniola, too. So sort of as an aside, I think we really need to uh, chew over shrine visibility and 
look at the diversity there and um, how it can both be intimately related to, communi to the communities and possibly, um, possibly as well as the ideas that people have about signaling and possibly in addition to some roles that don't involve visibility in the community at all. But so the main point I want to make this, this evening is about the great houses. So you have these two great houses that have very different histories. Um, and when you look at the visibility, they're interacting with their communities in a very different way. And actually, when we go into and look at the ceramic assemblages, um, we can look at to what degree the ceramic assemblages that are being used at these great houses resemble the, great house, resemble the ceramics being used at small sites. Um, and this is done generating a measure of similarity and again looked at over these 50 year intervals. We can talk more about the methodology in the discussion if people want. But interestingly, this tracks the same way. Kimbaniola is much more set apart by the ceramics that it's using relative to the sites that surround it. It's, um, it's <coughs> distinguished itself from those surrounding small sites. Whereas King Clijin is much better tied in, is more similar, is using a more similar ceramic assemblage to the small sites in the community. So we really start to see something that looks like two different kinds of great houses. Um, and of course, people have been, since, since, since people have been talking about a Chaco regional system, they've been talking about different kinds of great houses and how to get that. But I think the fact that we have this visibility that tracks with these different great house histories, that tracks with the ceramics, this is really something that's worth looking at in other places um, and really drilling down and seeing if this is a pattern that repeats. Because it looks a lot to me as if we see um, at Kinklijin something that's a lot better tied to its community, that perhaps needs the support of the local community, that's tied in a way that that earlier ancestral, possibly more elite great house at Kimbaniola um, is not, that Kimbaniola can afford perhaps to set itself apart. So coming back to the, uh, the big questions, she daringly risks the, the pad of paper again. So there are a vast number of ways in which archaeologists can address visibility and a vast number of reasons we might be interested in it. Um, and what I've given you tonight is one uh, quite modest example of how we can do this. And one point that I want to, you to take away, um, particularly if you're going to, um, particularly if you're, if you're interested in visibility in general and you want to um, chew over it in Chaco or anywhere else, one point that I want to make is that these are related but also distinct questions. So that when we deal with these, we have to develop methodology and models that address them specifically. So for example, if we're interested in communication in the sense of signaling, we're going to need to ask ourselves very different specific questions than if we're interested about long distance views of the landscape, for example. Um, if you are interested in defense, you're going to be asking different questions um, about what you can see on the landscape than if you are interested in um, just a view. It'd be interesting to compare defense and trade, actually. So one thing that a group of us are working on now um, and should have some interesting results in the future is continuing to look at this idea of um, the placement of Chaco great houses on the landscape using a methodology called total view sheds, which is um, very briefly a way of, attempt of taking a model of the landscape and attempting to quantify where the most visible places in that landscape are. So from, from anywhere in the landscape, if you're wondering the entire landscape, where are the places that really stand out? And um, this, is, this actually involves generating thousands of view sheds and adding them together. So it's, it's very computationally intensive. But I think it's going to give us some interesting results in terms of how to uh, test whether people are exploiting the most visible places on the landscape for great house placement. Um, and 
that project has a lot of collaborators. We're working, um, several of us at the U of A are working with um, folks at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Devin White and Kristen Safi, and we'll also be working with uh, some folks in um, Arkansas for the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies. So that's gonna be cool. But coming back to the takeaways specifically about Chaco, um, so at the very least, this hints that in, in real potential interesting differences between great houses, right? That we don't have, there isn't a single great house visibility model, and this really may track with how great houses interact with their communities, with um, changes in ideas about where great houses should be through time. So this is really something that I, I think is worth, it is suggestive and I think worth exploring further. But I also want to emphasize that um, in a very basic sense, if we're interested in Chaco and Great Houses as monumental, then we then the visibility matters. Chaco, Chaco visibility makes up only a visibility of any kind makes up only a very small part of, of Chaco studies, which is by God a whole crowded field by itself. But Visibility is still an important part, because if we're going to treat these structures as meaningful, it does matter under what context they're supposed to be viewed. And furthermore, we can't take, uh, we can't take, for, we can't take for granted, we can't assume that we already know those contexts. Just because Kimbaniola is huge, and by God, it's huge, um, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily highly visible relative to people's daily lives in the surrounding area. So essentially, coming back here to Ozymandias at the end, um, I don't know what kind of inscription Shelley would have imagined for Chaco Great Houses. I'm not even sure what kind of inscription I would imagine for Chaco Great Houses. Um, we haven't got inscriptions, but if we apply the right tools, we can start to dig into how these structures were meant to be seen. And I think that can produce some really interesting results. So before I take questions, I should um, acknowledge several people and institutions. Um, first of all, uh, the work that we've done recently was part of the Chaco Social Networks Project, which was funded by the NSF. Um, the, we collected uh, data quite some time ago at Kimbaniola with permission from the park. Um, we also used data from King Clijin, which was collected, um, again, with permission in the park, and Catherine Ellenberger very graci graciously shared that. And finally, this is, this is my practice to be an NPR announcer, and finally, the uh, Chaco Research Archive um, is doing a stellar job of making Chaco data available to the, to the wider research community. When I first did the research at Kimbaniola, um, to get the survey data, I had to drive to Santa Fe, photocopy six two-inch binders worth of site forms, drive it back to Tucson and make my own database. And now, because of the, the work that the Chaco Research Archive folks have done, I can download a database in my pajamas and search it, and believe me, it, it was a wonderful improvement. Um, and now I happily would like uh, to take questions or discussion. And I have a microphone here, which I will deliver to you, so you can uh, speak right into the mic and everyone can hear. Uh, I mentioned communication. Sure. What is the approximate distance to the area you're talking about to, for example, some place that all of us would recognize, Playa Bonita? How, how far apart and do you think that they communicated or was it a steps of communication Question number one. Question number two, how did you define shrines uh, around this particular area? Thank you. Sure. Um, first, so I'm continuing to fiddle with my own microphone, uh, Pueblo Benito is about 16 kilometers away from, um, 16 to 17 kilometers away from um, Kimbaniola. So, Way up the valley southwest. Um, so yeah, out, outside the valley proper a little bit. So, you know, I, you can, 
close in the human sense in that it's, you know, it's not, you wouldn't want to commute it, but you can certainly, it it's, wouldn't be a bad walk prehistorically. Um, people have talked about uh, the Kin Klejin Tower Kiva being intervisible with various points um, on South Mesa, or intervisibility with anything sort of down in the canyon is a problem because it's inside the canyon. Um, Kinbaniola itself, again, is sort of, it's, it's down in a basin, so the Great House is, un I cannot swear to this, but, um, because I haven't checked it directly, but it's, I don't think there's any way it can be intervisible, the Great House itself. But people have talked about uh, the shrines in both survey areas and some things that are also intermediate between them as stations um, between them and Chaco. So people have definitely talked about communication by that. Um, as far as defining shrines, in this case, I mostly cheated and used what the survey said. Um, um, yeah, yes, yeah. Surve survey says, um, several Chacoan scholars before me have assumed, um, but essentially the, uh, th there's some interesting morphological differences in, in the ones they have. Um, and there are, a there are a couple of sites at Kimbaniola that are sort of maybe, maybe not, but um, there are several that have sort of that what you would think of as a, um, a J shape or a horseshoe shape that are sort of, that are taken to be very distinctive um, of Chaco shrines. And there are a few others that are, um, are actually what are called stone circles, which is a terribly creative name. Um, but, and that's another mesa top feature that tends to be, um, a little bit larger and fully enclosed circle or, or oval. Um, Were you yeah. finding distinct objects in these shrines? So interestingly, um, the shrines tend to have very few artifacts. Um, they, they're out there on the slick rock of the mesa. There's not a lot. A few of them do have enough artifacts, sure, do, do have sherds, basically, to be dated. And um, those tend to date to the 1000s, the, the, the golden century of Chaco, and we, we tend to assume that the other ones do too. They excavated back in, I think, the 70s, they excavated one of these structures in Chaco Canyon and found a deposit that I believe had a stone bowl um, that was filled with turquoise beads. So there's been at least one of these places that people have... Um, have looked into and have really seen like, like okay, this, this has significant important stuff in it. But in general, they have very few artifacts that we can see. Um, thank you. Another question. Is Kinbiniola literally accessible, open to the public, or is it very difficult to get to, or is this something you can only access with permission, with a guide? How can people that are interested get there to see it? Um, I think I'm going to have to refer you to the Park Service website because when I, when I was out there to do field work, I believe it was publicly accessible. Um, and it was, as far as these things go, not difficult to get to. Um, kind, of a, kind of a haul if you're actually coming from the canyon itself. Um, I, and there's certainly, there, there's, there's, has been a trail or, you know, sort of a trail in the past, but I'm not, I'm not sure what the permissions are now. Um, King Clujin is slightly harder to get to. You have to be willing to drive around on two track roads. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily try it in a sedan and or in the rain, but um, they're both, um, Pending what the, what the Park Service says, that they, they can both definitely be got to. How much of each of those has been excavated? Neither of them has been excavated at all. Um, there may have been, there's been stabilization at both of them. Um, there may have been some um, very old, um, Weather Hill old, uh, 
excavation in Kimbiniola, but by and large, um, we really just have no data about what might be inside of either of them. We have a few tree ring dates from exposed timbers um, and pretty substantial ceramic collections from the surface, but that's about it. Um, not that I am aware of. Um, the Park Service ha certainly takes a, understandably the Park Service takes um, a very conservation heavy approach toward managing Chaco Canyon. Um, at the same time, there has been um, the group out of um, University of New Mexico has done a lot of work re-excavating areas of, Kim of um, Pueblo Benito. So um, it's, I don't think it's beyond the pale, but sometime in the future, some of these places will see more excavation, but there definitely aren't any plans at the present time. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I missed it in your talk, but is there any indication there's an astronomical uh, observations in either of these places? Um, it's a good question, and I, hmm. I couldn't necessarily tell you. There aren't obvious signs in the sense of, um, if you want to rank Chaco astronomy in terms of, you know, from the obvious sort of solstice markers down to debates about lunar maximum and minima and that kind of thing. Um, I suspect, um, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't obvious ones. Um, the, the, the folks who, get particularly keen on some of the rarer alignments, like, like the lunar ones, might have a different opinion, but. Is there a line of sight to Fahia Buttes from these two places? No, no. They're, um, well, I would have to check Kin Klijen. Um It would be, I would have to check Kin Klijen. There definitely isn't from Kin Biniola. Um, it would be a ways. So, yeah, I'd have to check King Lejeune. Definitely not from Kim Biniola. So at what point is it contemporaneous in construction with the rest of Chaco, the style? Uh, what other buildings? Yeah, so um, the early part of Kim Biniola is, um, has that same, what we would call type one masonry, which is this really Thin, um, thin sandstone and a lot of mortar crammed in. And um, there are a few tree ring dates in the early 900s. So that doesn't put it as early as, say, the earliest construction at Pueblo Benito, but it puts it in there with the early great houses in Chaco Canyon. So, um, so that really got rolling pretty early. Kin Klijin, um is much more contemporaneous with the major late expansion of what's going on both in Chaco Canyon itself and the Chaco world writ large. So in 1080, you think of, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna screw up the dates of the, of the Canyon great houses, but um, the expansions that you see like Pueblo Alto, um, things that are built in the 1000s and the great houses that you, the, really, the real expansion of great houses all around the San Juan Basin. King Klijin is more contemporaneous with that. Now, as far as the expansion of Kim Biniola, um, interestingly, at least some construction was done there pretty late. We have some tree ring dates in the 1120s, which is, you know, which is pretty late for the, the Chaco core area. Um, but I would caution that we can't necessarily say that Kim Biniola was just built in those two st big stages that it was an early great house and then it was massively expanded in the 1100s because it really is a very small number of tree ring dates. Um, this is in comparison to say the hundreds from Pueblo Benito that let us get at a really detailed construction sequence there. Did, did that answer your question? Thank you. And it, it would have those roads leading to it as well. Um, there are uh, roads or road-like features in these areas. Um, there's a little bit of debate about that. It's not, I mean, there isn't, for example, a really nice road between the two, um, but there are other landscape features around these, yes. Uh, on exhibit B, 
right. due west of Pueblo Alto, there's a shrine. And it doesn't look like it's with Gigi. It looks like it's too far north. 29 MC 291. All right, where are we? Okay, go to Pueblo Alto. Go do what? Go do east. So I'm looking at the map of the canyon. And <laughs> oh, no, so we're not, we're not talking about Pueblo Alto. We're talking about... There's a shrine. Okay, yeah, but this is, this is where I, we're in Kinminiola, right? Um, so Where is that shrine? Um, so this map that you're looking at is the Kimbaniola study area. Yo, this is this is Benito. And no, 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 no. This is this is just the area south of. So if you look at um, if you look at the map, well, this at this map, yeah, this this little area yeah. is what's shown on that map. So. None of the canyon great houses are on the map. It's just this little area, uh, okay. this small habitation so these sites. Long lines, short line of um, to a Mesa Verde, or what are they doing? No, those are um, those are longish lines of sight between um, a shrine and between small habitation sites. So they're probably about four kilometers long, which is too long to see what somebody's doing at at a shrine, probably. But um, maybe not too long to see that a building exists, uh, and certainly not too far to recognize the landscape feature that the shrine so is sitting on. Correct. Those are those are the local communities. One more question. Thank you much, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you One. again for coming out. Yes.